Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 26th of April to the 2nd of May, 2021. Before getting started this week, I'd like to send a special shout out to our good friends at Spacewatch.Global and GoTikonaut, two excellent sources of space industry news. Also, a very brief note to uh, check out the first edition of the Space Cafe Greater Bay Area uh, that was uh, conducted by myself in partnership with Spacewatch.Global last week, so you can check it out on their website. Now to get into this week's news updates, we have a, an update from China's Leo Broadband Constellation. We have a launch of a Long March 6 with a plethora of commercial satellites on board. But first, Jean will bring us a, an update on the launch of the Tianhe core module of the Chinese space station. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. John, can you tell us about Tianhe? Absolutely. So last week on April the 29th, we saw China successfully send the first module of the Chinese space station, the Tianhe module, uh, into orbit. And so this module was a 22.5 tons core module called, as, as mentioned, Tianhe, meaning heavenly peace. And this was done on board a Long March 5B, which is a variant of the Long March 5 rocket, but doesn't have a second stage and instead has an extended um, payload, payload fairing. And this is because the Tianhe module is just huge. It's over 16 meters long. And there's a picture where you see, um, the, uh, the core module next to the rocket that's sending it into space. And you see that it, you realize how big this, um, this thing actually is. And so, um, Long March 5 is already a beast of a rocket. It's, it sends, 23 to 25 tons into low Earth orbit. It puts it on par with similar rockets such as the Delta IV Heavy, the Ariane 5, the Falcon 9. And it's part of China's new generation of rockets, um, which use cleaner fuel that are launched from the Wenchang launch site um, from the southern island of Hainan. And so this, this launch site that's a uh, coastal launch site launches notably the Long March 5. Um, sevens and eight. And so Tianhe, this core module is rightfully named core module because it'll be the centerpiece of the station. It will host, for example, living quarters, it'll have a, a kitchen, it'll have a bathroom, it'll be the main control unit for trajectory and for attitude control. Um, it'll handle the fuel systems, the power systems, the air management systems. And it's designed overall for three Taikonauts, although it can reach up to six, notably during shifts uh, between teams of Taikonauts, and that's when there's a Shenzhou that's docked um, to the Chinese space station. It is composed of three parts. You have two cylindrical parts, as you can see on the diagram, and you also have a spherical node at one end, which hosts um, four docking ports. And so these four docking ports, therefore, uh, for example, Shenzhou crewed spacecrafts, they can be for Tianzhou cargo spacecraft, and they can also be for additional modules for the Chinese space station. And notably next year, we know that um, the Tianhe core module will be joined by two experimental modules called um, Meng Tian and uh, one Tian, and they'll connect to um, two of these four docking ports. And in 2024, so that's already in, in three years, the Chinese space station will be joined by a space telescope called Xun Tian. And this uh, Xun Tian telescope won't exactly be docked to the Chinese space station. It will be it'll, it'll evolve in the vicinity of the space station, and it will only dock to the space station for uh, notably, um, I think, maintenance operations and this kind of stuff. And this telescope also is a beast of a telescope. It has a mirror of two meters of a diameter, and that's comparable, slightly smaller, smaller, but comparable to the Hubble telescope. It has the resolution uh, of 0 0.15 arc seconds. That's similar again to, to Hubble, slightly lower, but perhaps more interestingly, it has a massive, massive field of view. It has a, a field of view, I think of 1.1 degrees times 1.1 degrees. And so that's uh, really beyond that of the Hubble telescope, which is something like 15 or 20 arc minutes, um, I think. And so, um, Regarding these three building blocks, three or four building blocks um, of the Chinese space station, um, to have them be assembled, we will, um, I mean, the Chinese will require multiple crewed missions, Shenzhou missions, and also Tianzhou cargo missions. And so Hao Chuan, 
the director of the CMSA, the Chinese Manned Space Flight Agency or uh, Engineering Bureau. He described last week in an interview to Xinhua uh, the process that would take place. And so basically, um, the deployment of the Chinese space station can be split into two phases. You have the first phase, which is this year, which is what is called the key technology uh, verification phase, the Guan Jian Ji Shu Yan Zheng Jie Duan. And so that's in 2021. This includes the deployment of the Tianhe Core module that was last week. And then we'll have two Tianzhou uh, launches and two launches is also of the Shenzhou uh, spacecraft. The first Shenzhou spacecraft will be launched, uh, so that's cargo, this month. And if that all goes well, it'll be followed in June by a Shenzhou uh, mission. So Shenzhou 12, which will take three Taikonauts uh, into orbit to the core module and for a stay of three months. And after that, we'll have a Tianzhou cargo mission again in September, followed by Shenzhou 13, a crewed mission in October. And this Shenzhou 13 crewed mission would take three Taikonauts to uh, the Tianhe core module for a stay this time of six months. And six months is supposed to be the standard time uh, that Taikonauts will be staying on the Chinese space station. And so five launches in 2021, that's the first phase. The second phase is called the orbital construction phase, the Kong Jian Zhan Zai Gui Jian Zhao Jie Duan. That's in 2022. And during this phase, we would have six launches. We have two launches of um, the, um, you know, the experimental modules, Wang Tian and Meng Tian. And you also have um, two launches of Tianzhou cargo and two launches of Shenzhou, which is, uh, which are crewed missions. And so altogether six launches and put together with what's happening this year, that's 11 launches um, you have. So all in all, three launches of modules, four crewed and for cargo. And also last fun fact, before I hand it over to Blaine, um, these different missions are launched by different rockets. The experimental modules are launched by Long March 5Bs. You need that massive payload capacity of the Long March 5. Uh, the Tianzhou are launched by the Long March 7. And the uh, Shenzhou, uh, Shenzhou, which is a much older spacecraft that flew for the first time in the early 2000s, they are launched by the much older Long March 2F. And this is from Zhou Chuan, a much older launch site. It's not from um, Wenchang. Well, a big congratulations to the Chinese space program and to everyone involved with the Long March 5B and with the with the Tianhe mission. So it's it's a huge uh, huge success and also just a really amazing time for human spaceflight because I think it was also last week that we had at one point 11 astronauts at the International Space Station at one point and then four of them uh, hmm. I believe came home recently. But anyway, um just a couple of very small points to add John to your very comprehensive rundown of the the Chinese space station. Um so First point, once again, we saw a major space event becoming kind of a major pop cultural phenomenon in China. Uh, so in recent years, we've seen a handful of Long March 5 launches from Hainan. And it seems like every time you get this sort of um, uh, pilgrimage of space fans that go down to Hainan and, and will just sort of be around Hainan waiting for the launch, and then they'll watch the launch. And you'll get a lot of posts on social media of pe these people in Hainan, and you see, you know, the, the launch itself becomes this big event. And um, this one was was no different. If anything, they they took up the theatrics even uh, a little bit more. So, so the first point is the um, the the Xi'an Symphony Orchestra, which was playing on the beach in Hainan as the Long March Five B with Tianhe was taking off in the background. So, it's uh, it's not quite a Tesla Roadster playing. Is it David Bowie uh, after the the Falcon Heavy launch? But it's. Um, you know, it's 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 close. I, I there's a wonderful video going around the internet that we'll we'll put up here of the the Xi'an Symphony Orchestra playing uh, in uh, in observance of the the successful launch of the the Long March Five B. Um, so I, I guess one one of the I, I would well I guess I would say this is the the latest example of of the government trying to to popularize space, and I do think that this is. Um, it's something that the the central government is becoming more aware of, I think, in, in terms of just the general potential of space, uh, not only for economic development, but also for soft power, for the inspiration of, of people, um, just as this kind of uh, thing that, that brings people in the country together. So I think we've, we've really seen um, space as kind of a broader pop cultural phenomenon come up again as, as, um, as this Long March 5B launch occurred. Um, so that being said, I don't have anything else on the 5B. Uh, Jean, are we all good from your side? Because I do have the next story. All good. Excellent. Well, the next story, I think, is another example of the Chinese government's increasing, uh, I think, awareness of the potential for, for space and I think also of the um, the the very fast developing times that we live in as it relates to space. 
So the next update that we talk about this week is uh, from Thursday, April 29th. We saw a press release from the State-Owned Assets Supervision and Administration Commission, so SASAC, uh, a very powerful central government body that oversees and in some cases administers state-owned enterprises. And this press release was about the creation of a new central enterprise called uh, China SatNet, the China Satellite Networks Group Company or Zhongguo Weixing, Wangluo Jituan, Youxian Gongsi, and uh, again, SatNet for short. And um, this press release was basically, it was very short, very concise, basically saying that, that SASAC has created this organization that is, um, well, yeah, this or SatNet. And uh, quite a lot to to unpack from this piece of news, I, I think. So the, the first one is that the creation of SatNet at this level in the SOE hierarchy is very significant. So SatNet is going to be administered directly by SASAC, which puts it at the same level as CASC and KASIC and also as the three big telcos. And so I think the most important thing to note from this press release is the creation of the holding company for China's answer to Starlink at this level of the SOE hierarchy. So basically, and this is a little bit speculative, we do not know with 100% certainty that SatNet is going to be the operating company for China's version of Starlink, but it seems very likely. And so the creation of such a company at this level of the SOE hierarchy, it gives it a certain degree of independence from companies like CASC or KASIC or the big three telcos, all five of whom are also at the same level of the SOE hierarchy. So basically, they're all directly controlled by SASAC. And so I think that the, the important thing to consider here is that when China is developing its Leo broadband constellation, its answer to Starlink, this company, SatNet, should, in theory, have a lot more independence for things like sourcing and for things like distribution and basically for many business model uh, and, and sort of strategic decisions than was the previous paradigm. And so the previous paradigm, I guess, just to provide a little bit more context, you had a project called Hongyan, which well, you still do have a project called Hongyan under CASC and a project called Hongyun under KASIC. And both of them were aiming to do a global low earth orbit broadband constellation, but you would have basically had a situation where Hongyan would have probably procured primarily things from CASC, satellites, launch vehicles, etc. Hongyun probably from KASIC. And the time when the constellations would have been kind of competing would have been after they were developed. It would have been quite wasteful. And it seems like now what the government has decided to do is say, we're going to cut that out. We're going to create one company and put it up at, at a higher level. And then they will be able to buy rockets from XSpace or from... CALT or from SAST or from you know, maybe land space. So I, again, I, I, getting back to the point here, I think that the, the most important takeaway is this idea that the operating company for China's Leo constellation is going to be a sort of um, a national level SOE. Um, yeah, so I think that that's the, the first major point of this um, about this this update from uh, from SASAC about SatNet. Um, I think the second major point that I would highlight is the fact that this uh, SatNet uh, company has been created in Xiong'an, which is a new area of, um, I guess, technically a Baoding city in Hebei province. And so basically, Xiong'an is a uh, new capital city that the central government has built to move many non-core government functions. It's about 100 kilometers south of Beijing and about 100 kilometers west of Tianjin. And... Um, the article mentions that SatNet is going to be the first central state-owned enterprise to be uh, registered in Xiong'an. So you have this, um, I think, this real kind of ability for the central government to exercise a, a fair amount of control over SatNet in the sense that it is not a subsidiary of CASC. It is a, a directly SASAC-controlled entity. And it is uh, in Xiong'an, which is a relatively new, small city that I, I think is quite... Um, there are probably there's not, there's not as much going on as there is in Beijing, so I think there's probably it's a bit easier to keep keep track of things. Um, so again, I think the second major point here would be that this is a a company that is headquartered in uh, in Xiong'an, which is um, it's an interesting choice. And and just a, a very last point on on Xiong'an, and then I will bring it to my my final point on uh, on Satnet. Um, so Xiong'an, a few years ago when it was named the this new administrative capital, uh, apparently the real estate prices they uh, like doubled or tripled overnight. So there's an article that we'll post as well in the uh, in the show notes. So last point about Satnet. Um, so apparently the the signing ceremony for uh, between Satnet and Xiong'an New District was presided over by Han Zheng, who's a member of the Politburo Standing Committee, 
the deputy party secretary of the state council and the first premier of the PRC. So he would be one of the probably seven most powerful people in, in China. And apparently his attendance was part of a day trip by Han Zheng from Beijing down to Xiong'an, uh, during which time he conducted some standard visits to places like schools and factories and that kind of thing. Um, he also presided over a meeting of the Beijing Tianjin Hebei Coordinated Development Leading Group, which is a group dedicated to promoting regional development in Jinjinji area of Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei. Uh, and so Han Zheng, again, the, one of the most powerful people in China, noted that SatNet would be, again, the first uh, central enterprise registered in Xiong'an. So just a couple of questions, I think, that are worth thinking about as it relates to SatNet moving forward uh, with this new news. So how big is SatNet going to be? If we look at companies like Cask, Kasich, and the three telcos, they all have well over 100,000 employees. Um, SatNet probably would not have 100,000 employees on day one, but it would still probably be a quite large organization. Uh, second point, how will they be staffed? So presumably most of the well, uh, many of the most well-qualified people in China to build a Leo broadband constellation are working for Cask or Kasich or the telcos or some of the new space companies. So it'll be interesting to see, do we see a talent war among space companies? Mm -hmm. uh, do we see some? Yeah. Um, and then just the last question, and then I will hand it over to Jean and go turn on the air conditioning because it's getting to be summertime in Hong Kong, is, um, you know, what is SatNet's mandate? Are, is it going to be responsible to build and maintain the constellation, but then also act as a reseller, like kind of a telco from space? Or is it simply going to build the constellation and then you're going to have maybe the telcos buy lots of capacity and resell that capacity through their distribution networks? So, again, I think um, a lot of questions yet to be answered, but uh, very big news that we have this SatNet company being registered in Xiong'an. Uh, anything to add, John, from your side? I think those three questions that you raised were all um, excellent questions. And maybe to go a little bit um, beyond SatNet and just discussing this broadband Leo constellation, I'd wonder also, what is the timeline of the rollout of this Chinese Leo constellation? Um, and I, I mean, you know, as, as mentioned in the last episode, Hongyan or was it Hongyun was planned for full deployment around 2020. And, you know, here we are in 2021 and there isn't that much done just yet. But, um, I would speculate that this massive constellation would be deployed quite soon. Um, we know that satellite internet was added to the new infrastructures policy last year. There was a lot of discussion also on satellite internet during the two sessions with calls from people from such as Lei Jun, for example, the CEO of Xiaomi to include the full deployment of this constellation. Um, during the 14th five year plan. And just, I think the pressure that China is feeling from the rapid pace that, um, SpaceX has for its Starlink constellation. I think that also encourages the Chinese to to deploy a, a much faster, I mean, as fast as possible. I think the, that's the second question that I would ask on this Leo constellation uh, from China is what is going to be, who, who are going to be the end users? What's going to be the market? Because for Starlink, for example, we know that uh, consumer broadband is going to be a very big thing. And um, this is going to be a bit trickier for a Chinese broadband constellation because first of all, the broadband infrastructure on the ground in China is already very good. So you don't have that many areas, uh, rural areas without broadband. And even if you do have some of these areas, these rural areas are perhaps much more impoverished areas compared to the equivalent in the US and so much more you know, price sensitive. And we know that this is an issue for, this is a big question for the constellations to be able to make uh, terminals at an acceptable cost for um, the, the, well, the, 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 you know, the, the consumers that will be using this type of connectivity. So um, I think there's that. It could, it could be that the market is beyond Chinese borders and Belt and Road countries. And definitely there's a much uh, smaller or less developed a broadband um, infrastructure on the ground in those countries. But again, you have the issue of price sensitivity compared to areas such as North America, uh, Europe, or, or, you know, Australia. And so, um, so I guess there's also a, a question mark there on who will be using this constellation. And is there a business case for um, such a constellation? My two cents is to look for Pinduoduo to rent a lot of capacity because I think they're really pushing into the very agricultural parts of China and trying to do a lot of things in in smart agriculture and and there I think I mean you know the the, the Chinese terrestrial network is is excellent I, I that's for sure but I do think um, there's I think there's still a lot of China that's not 
particularly well connected. So yeah, maybe maybe Pinduo Duo will be bulk leasing lots of capacity from Satnet. What a day that would be. Um, okay, any uh, nothing at well. I, I guess uh, Sean, you want to take us to the, the Long March six launch from uh, from earlier this week? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll leave Pinduo Duo for for our next uh, dedicated episode. So Long March 6th, that's the last piece of news uh, from this week. Uh, we saw on April the 27th, China launched an impressive launch share mission on board of Long March 6th with nine satellites on board. And as you would expect on a launch share, you had multiple payloads from different customers and doing many different things. Um, and so all of these payloads are actually quite interesting to comment. And um, what I'm going to do is go quickly through the payloads, and then we, Blaine and I can share some of our takeaways. So uh, out of those no, nine satellites, the first two satellites were from the Chilu constellation. And so you had Chilu 1 and Chilu 4. Chilu 1 is a synthetic aperture radar remote sensing satellite that also had laser intersatellite links payload on board. Uh, we also had Chilu 4, which is a high resolution pan chromatic remote sensing satellite. And both satellites uh, were for the Shandong Institute of Industrial Technology. Their third satellite is Foshan 1. It's also a high res pan chromatic remote sensing satellite. It was built for the Jihua Laboratory, uh, which is a, a provincial level state research lab that's based in the southern city of Foshan. And the satellite is named after this city. Um, Four satellite is Zhongan Guotong 1, or also called Hangsheng 1, and we've mentioned this satellite in past episodes previously. Um, so this satellite is manufactured by the Chinese company Hangsheng Satellite. It's um, a remote sensing satellite for the Shenzhen company Zhongan Guotong. And interestingly, we'll mention this in a couple of minutes, this satellite also had payloads coming from other, um, other Chinese companies. So it was also a technology verification platform. Next, we have Guodian Gaoke. So this company uh, is deploying uh, uh, an IoT constellation. It's already deployed quite aggressively some satellites in 2020, I think around five or six. And this is the first launch uh, in 2021 for the company. So Tianqi 9. Um, ultimately, we have Origin Space, which is a space mining company. They launched the satellite NEO 1, which is a plan to trial the capture of a sm small celestial body in orbit and do a number of um, orbital maneuvers with this body. Next, we have Golden Bauhinia 1 and 2, also two remote sensing satellites that are manufactured by Zero Gravity Labs. And finally, we have um, Taijing 2, which is a satellite manufactured by Minospace, also remote sensing satellite. Now, um, some of my quick takeaways here. First thing I think it's, this is really interesting is what we see here in this launch is really uh, a snapshot of Chinese commercial space in action. You see from what I described just now that you have commercial satellite manufacturers. You have the Minospaces, the Zero Gravity Lab, the Hangsheng Satellites. You also have Chinese commercial payload manufacturers, subsystem manufacturers. You have um, also uh, the companies that are providing the tracking, the telemetry services. They're also commercial companies. Uh, there's, for example, Satellite Herd that provided TTNC for three of the satellites. And you also had Tianlian do the same for the other satellites. And so this is just, um, you just, you see the uh, industrial chain of uh, Chinese commercial space in action here working together. And also, interestingly, there are interconnections with more state-owned players, such as, for example, um, Microsat, which is linked to um, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. You have Long March 6, which is, um, you know, one of the big state-owned um, launch vehicles that belong to. So this is SAS that's manufacturing Long March 6. Um, so that's the first one, first interesting point. The second one is uh, the massive interest that China has for remote sensing. And you you, uh, I don't know if you pick this up, but all of the, literally all, not all, but um, most of the satellites on this uh, launch share launch was uh, were remote sensing satellites. And so we also saw notably this China's second commercial synthetic aperture radar um, satellite, the Chilu-1, um, and the, the first one being the, the, the satellite that was sent in November 2020 by SpaceT, the high c one So just very interesting to see this a strong interest um, from commercial space for remote sensing. And this comes in parallel to also a very strong remote sensing program um, coming from um, China's state-owned civil um, remote sensing program, the, the you know, the, the, the Chios, the, the, the Galfin, the, the Galfin satellites, basically. Um, and last thing I want to mention here before handing it over to Blaine is one of the payloads that we had on the Hangzhou 1 satellite. So it wasn't the main payload, but it was a very interesting payload because we haven't mentioned this previously on the uh, on the on the podcast so it's this um payload by Yun Yao Yuhang it's a GNSS radio occultation payload so 
what is this actually? Um, Genesis occultation basically is you have a satellite in low Earth orbit and um, you have um, GNSS, you know, SatNAS um, constellations that are in medium Earth orbit that send these signals. And so the LEO satellites that's lower is able to receive these signals. But these signals um, go through the atmosphere. And so there's this refraction phenomenon where uh, the atmosphere bends uh, the electromagnetic magnetic waves that are sent uh, by the, uh, for example, for GPS satellites. And so this bending can be measured by the LEO satellite and the amount of bending, the angle uh, can help um, the LEO satellite deduce uh, parameters on the atmosphere because it's linked to temperature, to uh, humidity, to pressure, all these uh, valuable data that can be used, for example, for meteorology, for astronomy, and just for other, other applications. This is quite a new technology, and it's nice to see that there's a Chinese company that's working on building a constellation of these uh, with this technology. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's just three of the takeaways that I want to share here. There are probably uh, quite a few more. Um, Blaine, do you have any, any thoughts on some of these um, launches? And what a time to be alive, just deriving information about the atmosphere from the amount of bending of GNSS signals as they, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible. So yeah, I mean, definitely a very impressive launch. And uh, it's interesting, it's the, I guess, uh, something that we're seeing now a couple times per year is the, you know, Long March 6 from SAST launching a handful of different payloads. So as we saw last year, November, um, a similar launch with 13 satellites for a few different customers, um, which we covered on the Dongfang Hour Episode 7. Um, definitely agree with your point that SAR is a very hot topic in China nowadays. Um, we've also seen ComSat getting more into SAR recently, Beijing Smart Satellite through their um, their deal with Tongchuan City. Um, I, I guess to your other point, I suspect this is probably due to just the massive number of, of optical satellites that we've seen launched by China over the last you know five or five or so years, um, with all the you know Gaofan and, and Yaogan, and then also um, the Jilin One constellation, which is not entirely but predominantly optical. Um, and and I guess as we've mentioned before, just this idea that EO is one of is probably the seen as the most open of the different types of, of satellite applications um, as compared to, to comms or satellite navigation that are considered a bit more closed. So I guess all of those things contributing to the SAR boom, but um, definitely there's a, a lot of SAR coming online in China. Uh, also interesting to see a satellite being launched by a, a company in uh, in Foshan, but it was by Jihua Labs, was it? Or I, I needed to... Uh, G yeah, Jihua. I think that's it, Jihua yeah. Labs. Yeah, yeah, Jihua Laboratory, yeah. So... Um, uh, yeah, so I, another example, I guess, of this emergence of a, a space sector in the province of Guangdong, which, as we've mentioned before, um, is ve you know very large in terms of population and also in terms of economy, but has thus far not really had as much of a of a space impact as um, as its you know as its size might otherwise suggest. Um, and so, I mean, Foshan, for for example, the, the city where, where Zihua Laboratories is, is from. Um, it's a pretty developed city. There's about 10 million people living there. It is near Guangzhou, and it's home to major manufacturers such as Midea and Galans, among other companies. Um, and so, yeah, Jihua Laboratories, they, they seem to be located in an industrial park about halfway between the municipal government of Foshan and the provincial government of Guangdong. Um, so about 13 kilometer trip to each from, from their office. So I think this, um, I, I presume now it's not entirely clear what their their satellite is going to be doing. I guess Earth observation of some kind, um, but I presume Earth observation. Uh, I mean, most of the most of the end users for EO still in China are like provincial or city governments, and so I would not be very surprised if they were aiming to um, to commercialize some of the the data that they're going to be procuring or some of their otherwise some of the satellite uh, capabilities. Um, with one of those governments that is about 13 kilometers away from their office. So we'll be interesting to see uh, how Guangdong continues to develop a space sector. Uh, there's still, there's a lot of, a lot of very wealthy, very specialized companies in the province that could benefit from some uses for, for space applications. And so, yeah, that'll be interesting. Um, last point is that this is yet another example of a state-owned enterprise, in this case, SAST. Uh, benefiting from an increasing number of commercial companies. So again, SAS provides the Long March 6, and a handful of commercial companies that need a ride into space are now customers of SAS. So it's, um, I think that the, as the larger the commercial part of the sector gets as a customer of the SOEs, 
the more difficult I think it will be in certain cases for the SOEs to just kind of impose their will upon the sector. So we'll see how this continues to play out. But in the meantime, uh, again, congratulations to uh, to SAST and to uh, to all of the companies that successfully got their satellites into orbit this week. That's uh, good stuff. Um, anything else from your side, Sean? Are we uh, we all good to go for the week? I'm all good for this week. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Well, this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 26th of April to the 2nd of May. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. And thank you for watching or listening. We will see you next time. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.